I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some of your evening with us. I hope you uh, learn something tonight and, uh, and feel something uh, for our Lord and Savior. Uh, I'm happy to, tonight to introduce Danny Larson. Danny, thanks for coming and sharing your story. Thank you, Earl. It's a most interesting story, and I hope we get to, to all of it. <laughs> Tell <laughs> us a little bit about your history as a Latter-day Saint. Well, I grew up in Boise, Idaho, to parents that uh, were semi-active. My dad really wasn't much, didn't go to church very often, but my mother took us once in a while. Yeah. I was baptized at eight, um, but um, just went because I was expected to. And the friend, your friends went probably? Some yeah. of my friends, yes. Yeah. And um, you went through the Aaronic Priesthood steps and all that I stuff? I did, uh -huh. ordained uh, into the uh, Aaronic Priesthood and yeah. uh, Te you know, deacon, teacher, priest. Yeah. Did you take seminary in high school? I anything? did not. Didn't, huh? No, you I wasn't. I wasn't really interested in church. Uh, and seminary was an early morning program. And um, oh, I just... Oh, you didn't have a release time like they do no. in Utah. So. No. Okay. I know you were quite the football player. You had scholarships to several schools. And uh, tell us about that a little bit. Yes. Uh, you know, athletics was really my interest in... And the things that I did in school were all surrounding track and football and that sort of thing. I enjoyed that um, and was recognized by several schools. And, uh, but when it came to my senior year, Rick's College in Eastern Idaho was heavily recruiting me. Yeah. Um, they told me that if I came to Rick's College that I could start as a freshman. And wow. um, so I know my mom was hoping I would you know, accept that scholarship. Excited, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think she was hoping I'd go to Syrix College and find a good Mormon girl to marry. Oh, okay. And uh, since I'd, all my friends were not members of the church, I've never dated a Mormon girl before. Oh, and um, so I, I took them up on the offer. Yeah. And uh, after graduating from high school, I enrolled and that showed really up for football in school at Rick's College. Wow, now that's, is it called, what's it called now? I think it's called BYU-Idaho. BYU -Idaho. Uh -huh. Okay, and I, did they require a Religion classes like BYU would? They did. They yeah. required a religion class. However, uh, when I was going to college that first semester, I did not go very much. I didn't go to any of the church meetings that they had on Sunday or during the week. I didn't even know where it was held. Really? It yeah. wasn't a requirement then? It kind of was a requirement, oh, but okay. I was avoiding it because... I wanted to have fun. That was really there to play football and have fun. <laughs> Any guilt involved in all this? None. Nah. None at <laughs> Just all. Just having a good time. Just having huh? a good time. So what happens next? Well, at the end of the school year, uh, I should say at the end of the football season in the fall, um, some of the guys on the team, we decided to go out and celebrate and we're having some fun. Yeah. And not living not up to... Not church fun. Not <laughs> living up to the... Yeah, not church fun. Yeah. And... Uh, we they the school found out about it oh. and so i was going i was being brought in by the dean and uh question as to why and what happened and pretty much they had it figured out 
Okay. And you know, by then I was tired of Rick's College. Uh, I liked football, but I was ready to <laughs> to move on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to another college where I could have more freedom and yeah. not so many so much constraint. Yeah. And then, right during that week, um, I had a bishop who I should have been going. You know, I'm the bishop of my the ward that I lived in, the student ward. The student whatever. ward yeah. came to my apartment mm -hmm. and wanted to talk to me. I let him in. We sat there in my in the front room, just him and I. And as he began to talk to me about the gospel, I guess, and God, things that really I wasn't that familiar or comfortable with, I felt, we both felt, a presence come into the room that was so strong wow. that it, it, it actually just uh, grabbed hold of me. And my emotions got the best of me. I trusted this man. He was a very loving, God-fearing man, I could tell. And he asked me questions about my past as a youth, and I told him all the things that I had done up to that point, uh, not really expecting to go anywhere, but he asked if he could kneel with me and pray. Wow. I took, I said, sure. We knelt down across uh, from a chair, held hands, and I thought, I just get through this, and he'll be on his way, and everything will be fine. Had you ever done this before? Never done that no. before. No. <clears throat> However, as he held my hands, and, we, and he prayed on my behalf, asking God to forgive me for my sins, again, that flood, uh, that, that spiritual feeling, that overwhelming love that I had come into my being was, I couldn't explain it. Yeah. And I started to cry. I became very emotional. And I didn't, it was amazing, and he did too. And by the time we got done, I, could, I actually felt two hands on my shoulders pressing me down. And I knew that was God revealing himself to me in some fashion yeah. and letting him know, letting me know that he loved me, that he cared for me, wow. and that he was aware of me. Wow. And when it was all said and done, uh, we stood up and embraced and he said, I said, what happened? And he explained that he felt God was reaching out to me and he would do everything he could at this point if I was willing to keep the, the, the rules of the college, the standards to um, talk to the dean and, and see if he could keep me on campus for the following semester. So he went in your behalf? I, I agreed, I, yeah. I said, I'll do that. Yeah. He did, and I was on a probationary. Uh, but, you, but you were able to stay. I was able to stay, and every Friday I would visit, visit Dean Yost, and he, him, and I became very close friends. Wow! But I, at that point, started going to church. That was part of the agreement. Started going to church, uh, took my religion class, and I began to hunger after you know, knowledge. I began to hunger after the Word of here, God. all this time, you really, you've I had been a no, member of the church, but you really didn't know much, I guess. I didn't. And, yeah. And it was quickly after that that I started to realize that what had happened to me would, have, would be wonderful if it happened to more people. And I knew guys were going on missions, but yeah. I didn't really know what that meant too much. Uh, <laughs> really? The more, I, the more I looked into it, the stronger my desire came, became to share this experience or this change in my life, yeah. this born again experience that I somehow had had with other people. And so I applied to go on a mission. And because of my shady past, fun. <laughs> as my fun, um, they required, see, I, this was in November that I had that experience. I wanted to go on my mission before the end of this coming summer. And uh, so I could come back in two years and go back, get back into football. Oh, okay. So normally they would make me wait a whole year before they would give me the Melchizedek priesthood and let me go through the temple. Yeah. But I went through two different general authority interviews to be cleared, and I received my mission call in August of well, that next. Just, just the way you wanted. As a 19-year-old, yeah. just like I wanted, and I was I was able to go to Ireland yeah. on my mission, which was a real great opportunity to be in a foreign country and I met amazing people there and ha I had a very successful mission yeah. not so much because I knew a lot more because I had this ability to convey to others that God loved them yeah and um, and that they could have a change of heart like I'd had like you'd had yeah because so, I don't think many missionaries or not certainly not very many have 
have this uh, immense uh, or this intense kind of a change of heart, probably. Why me? Yeah. I mean, I nobody that I had met on my mission had, and yeah. um, but I think I was just so stubborn and maybe needed that jolt, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for God to catch me early in my life. To, yeah. so that I could start to head in a different direction. Well, I thought well, everything, I thought that experience that I had at Rick's had everything to do with Mormonism. You know, I thought there was a connection well, there. Well, sure. You know, uh, but now I realize I could have had that experience. That was just I, God telling you he loved you. Yes, yeah. I could have had that experience with a, a minister or a, a pastor while I attended another college of higher learning. Yeah. I mean, just happened to be, I was, there. Yeah, I had to deal with a few of those special moments in time, you know, where you had those strong feelings, but I realized that was just between me and God, and, yeah. he, and he loved me. Well, so you come home from your mission and... Came yeah. home, I married, a, I went back to Boise, married a, the bishop's daughter. Oh, really? <laughs> and um, we got married in the Salt Lake Temple. Uh, we went to BYU one year. I transferred there to play uh, rugby on their football team there, or their rugby team. Rugby team yeah. And then we transferred back to Boise. Uh, we started to have children, and while I was finishing up college in Boise, I was teaching early morning seminary. Yeah. And while I was there, oh, to young to the to the high school kids. Yes, I guess. the high school. Yeah. And the um, coordinator for the CES program for the church happened to be in Boise and stopped by, I just dropped into my class and said afterwards, how would you like to teach full time? And I didn't know what that meant. He said, well, we would actually hire you after you graduated from college and you, we would send you to a location where you would teach, teach. all day long in a high school in yeah. a release time. Wow. And I thought, okay, that's, that's pretty special, that good. isn't it? Because not. I mean, usually there's a huge process for, I think. That's what he to told me, yes. Probably um, worse now than it was back back then, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so you did that for? So we moved to Ogden, where I taught at Bonneville High School for five years, yeah. and uh, I loved it, but it was tough when I had five children, and raising a family on that income was really difficult. I, yeah. I wanted something better to support my family, so I left the program, and I ended up, um, I ended up Doing finding another profession that yeah. I've done the rest of my... Now, during this time, during your mission, I guess, even, and you, you've been through the temple now a few times, married, and, and certainly before your mission, and then now a CES teacher, anything that ever came up that caused you to ponder or think a nothing, little bit? like Nothing really during like, that time. Really, nothing? Mm -mm. Okay, so what happens next? So, I was... But the thing I was doing while I was teaching seminary, I was so focused on the curriculum and what they had as teaching that I never was able to really sit down and study the Bible like I wanted to. Yes, because you were always switching subjects. You wanted to study the Bible? I did. I, I, I yearned for that. And so I began to study it more. And then um, during this period of time, I also really got involved in academics, the, the, the uh, apologetics of, of Mormonism and, and joined farms. Um, oh, wow. the farms program, which is now FAIR, to learn mm -hmm. all that I could about the apologetics of, of Mormons and their defense, um, defending their faith. So you were learning some of the pros and cons. Yes, uh -huh. but I, I found their arguments weak, and I still continued to Who, question. Who's, the farms? The farms, yes. You mean what they were, how they were How defending. they were trying to defend uh, yeah. Mormonism and... I call it stretching. Yes. It just seems like they had to... Ooh, to do, to make anything make sense, it had to kind of That's true. stretch out or something. I don't know. That's right. Um, and then I continued to be very active. I was, you know, held many positions in the in the church, leadership positions in the stake, on the high council, in a couple of branch presidencies. Wow. Um, I was a seventy. I was the eldest quorum president, so I was very busy, and I loved the busyness of it. I yeah. love working with people. I taught mission prep in our stake for years. Oh my goodness. Um, so I became f very familiar once again with the scriptures the missionaries use. Yeah. And, uh, but but I, I, I found that as I went, continued to go to church, that there was a lack of Jesus in the conversation. You noticed that? Oh yes. I went. I, I never did. I struggled with it. I, I, be, I began to, my heart began to ache for it. And I wonder why. 
And then one day I went to my bishop and I just said, I need to be released from all my callings. I need to step back from the forest to look at the trees. Wow. I need to decide. That's not something he wants to hear. Because you know sure. how it is, I've, you know, Earl, you have questions and so you keep putting those questions on the shelf yeah, yeah. and ho thinking that maybe I'll look at those someday. That was time for me to look at those. Okay. And so I took the time and, um, and, and I began to study each one of the issues that were concerning me. And as I did, it just began to unfold. I started to read the Bible more, the New Testament, and it was so beautiful. And it began to teach me th things that I'd never seen before. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. And you were probably seeing some of those LDS scriptures we used over and over again yes. in, a, in, the, in the true context. Let me tell you an experience I had with a, two missionaries that came by my house just a little over a year ago. Knocked on my door one winter morning, and I, I let them in, and they asked, why I hadn't been attending church. Yeah. I told them that I was what, I was, what I was doing, I was studying and finding answers to questions that I had and I began to realize that I was, that Mormonism was not true. As they go, went to go to those scriptures to help strengthen their position, their position <laughs> I had them read it in context. And as we did, their eyes widened and they began to realize that the things they were teaching were either out of context or they didn't have the you know they were being very selective in what yeah. they were trying to do we went on like that for about a half hour back and forth yeah. looking at those scriptures finally the senior companion walked out of the house all by himself without his companion he didn't say goodbye or anything he just walked out of the house he, he just didn't have any answers or was I didn't know what happened or something I, I asked his companion what just transpired and he says I don't know, I don't know. we're sorry brother Larson and so I shook his hand and he left five days later that those same two missionaries returned at my doorstep and I let him in yeah. this time their disposition had changed you could tell they were smiling very friendly and they wanted to apologize for the way they acted while the senior companion had gotten up why he had left yeah. and I asked him well why did he he said I was I was surprised at what we were reading and and I was I was frustrated that I didn't have an answer for it and in the meantime my companion and I have been studying a lot during the last five days and we've come back and now we want you to teach us oh my goodness and I told him if I do, your mission, mission president isn't going to be very happy with you. No. And they said, we really don't care at this point. We just want to know more. Wow. And so it was a wonderful hour I spent with them. Um, I could not believe it, but I also knew that this was God's way of reaching out and touching these young men. I told them that when they get home, they need to read more of the Bible yeah. and, and discover for themselves. And so we had a prayer and they left. Well, I really hadn't been sharing this experience, this changing in my life, this realization that Mormonism was not true. Were you still going to the LDS church? No, I hadn't gone at all. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to stay neutral. Yeah. But I was watching your your program. Oh, Ex really? Uh huh. And not not right away. The first time I saw you was on Sean McCraney's show. Oh. Yeah. And uh, you were reading your letter, and oh, I thought, so. here's a bishop who's come to the same realization that I have. And I could relate to that. I began to attend campus and bought, you know, uh, Sean's book, Born Again Mormon. Yeah. I related to his experience. And the more I went to campus and continued to worship there, I just felt this wonderful, wonderful experience that I had missed in the Mormon church uh, that I needed to have with my increasing my relationship wow. with Jesus Christ. Oh, and. Of course, the bishop of my ward, which was a new bishop, he had been, my old bishop had been replaced, he wanted to find out more about what was going on with me. So he came to my house and visited, and, and he said, what's your intentions now that you're, you've left Mormonism? And I said, I don't know what you mean. He said, are you going to proselyte my members? And I said, oh. <laughs> he was said, worried about his flock. Huh? Yes, he said, I'm the, sh I'm, the, I'm the bishop, I'm the shepherd of this flock, and I yeah. intend to protect it. And I said, from what? The truth? What are you afraid of? And I asked him a very important question, and that is, if the church wasn't true, would you want to know? And he said, I wouldn't want to know. And I was totally taken you? back by that. Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't you want to know? Yeah. And I realized that, you know, people in the church, they're, you know, they're ingrained. Yeah. Their families, their, it's a society, their culture. 
everything was built around the church, and so it, it would is. be very difficult for them to leave. Yeah. Um, but he he was worried that I was going to talk to other people, yeah. and warn me that I shouldn't, or that something might happen to me. Yeah. yeah, there would be consequences. Well, I started to think maybe I need to do more uh, instead of being so passive about it. So I've started to write a letter, and uh, it, it was turned out to be a dialogue between Mormon missionaries and a Christian. And these missionaries show up at the Christian's door, and there, this this conversation ensues where and they cover a, a topic comes topics. up. Okay. And uh, and so in this letter, it's a it's a missionaries, and then it's the Christian and it's missionary and the Christian all the way through the, and uh, they talk about a number of things like um, the the Book of Abraham or the Book of Mormon or the priesthood or polygamy, whatever it may be polygamy. Is, yeah. And so as I as I wrote these letters, I I addressed them to 120 families that live within my ward, members and non-members. Oh boy! I had the ward list. When was this? Just this was over a year ago. This was just about just within the last year. Or a so. year and a, yeah, about a year and three two. months ago. Wow. And I put my name at the bottom and my address, and my phone number, and my email in case anybody wanted to respond. But I also said it with love. Yeah. It was a very, you know, a tactful way of, of explaining the gospel truth rather than the gospel of and Jesus Christ. you sent out several of these. I've sent out, every two months I send out one. <laughs> still? I, yes, oh, do you? still. Just sent one a new one out. <clears throat> wow. Well, the bishop um, talked to the stake president, and they decided to to call a church yeah, high council. Yeah, yeah. And so back in October, they convened, heard my story. I did not attend. Mm -hmm. um, and they made their decision to excommunicate me for apostasy. Wow. And when I got the letter, the th one thing that kind of shocked me was I expected to you know, read what I saw there in the letter, except for when it got to the point where they said, you no longer have the companionship of the Holy Ghost. And I thought, oh my, that is totally the opposite of what I've been experiencing this last many years. Yes, uh, yeah. I mean the increased uh, feeling of having the Holy Spirit with me has been the the most exciting thing of this whole process. And he's telling me I no the longer have the right it. to have it. Yeah. And I, how can a man tell me that? Yeah. Well, he's now on my mailing list, and so <laughs> as these letters go out, I also it also goes out to him. Wow. I'm just hoping that maybe well, sometime, somewhere, somebody yeah. may stop and think about what I'm, you know, trying to convey to them. Was there just a moment, though, and I, again, I'm not sure about, I mean, you obviously developed some respect in the area you were in, be, being on the High Council of 70 and all these different activities, maybe you were in different places, but certainly a level of respect, CES teacher and all that. Um, so when you when you shared your story, didn't you hope and feel that they would yes. say, gee, Danny, you, you must have learned something. Could you share with us? <laughs> of course, now you are through the letters, but you didn't get much of that, I suppose. I got none of that. Yeah, I didn't either. No. Yeah. I, the one thing that I, I have been surprised by is that people don't want to talk about Jesus. They are, I think, they're, a, and you know, we're talking about return missionaries and men who have been around a long time that have this Melchizedek priesthood, yeah. and they just don't understand their scriptures. They don't understand how to talk about it. Isn't that They're afraid, I believe. Well, so what does the Bible mean to you now? The Bible means everything to me. I mean, I make it a, a daily study. Yeah. Um, I love it. Um, the Gospel of John has been a life-changing experience Isn't that for me. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. To come to know the the true God yeah. of the Bible, as opposed to the, Bob, the, the God of Mormonism, yeah. that He is truly Jesus Christ, is truly God incarnate, and that He died for my sins. Well, what would you say then to the Mormons who often say, "Well, we're Christian. What uh, what are they missing? What have we learned?" <laughs> well, I think I think that the Mormons need to that the LDS they're great people, and they're well intended. They just need to be willing to ask the question, if the church wasn't true, would I want to know? Yeah. And be honest about that. And if they ask that question and pray it to God, He will open up their, their eyes and their hearts, and He will lead them to the truth. There's nothing to fear about truth. No. And so um, they just need to be honest about it. Yeah. And they don't understand grace and works, do they? No, they don't. What, uh, what would you say to them about that? Well, 
if they read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 10, yeah. they'll find that, you know, God, it's a gift that God gives us, grace is, yeah. and, when, and He forgives our sins. And then as a result of our changed heart and our love for Him, we will want to do works for others. We want to work for Him. It yeah. just comes naturally. It comes from our heart. It doesn't have to be mandated. We don't have to become worthy. None of that is important, you know. It's just... Um, Has it been joyful to be what, you, what we call a new creature in Christ? Yes, it's, yes. And, and you could never... I hate to say it quite this way, you could never go back, could you? Oh, never. What would you have to give up and ignore <laughs> to go back? I'd have to give up Jesus Christ being God. Yeah. He'd just have to go back to being my brother, my elder brother. Yeah. And I'd... Not I'd, trust the Bible. Not trust the Bible. Which you know, would be sad. Would, would be sad. I'd have to believe in the Book of Abraham, which I know is a fraud. And the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And so there's so many things that I would... Uh, I, I just couldn't go back to at all now yeah. that I know the truth. Wow. Well, Danny, there is just a minute. Now your time has just flown by. What would you say to the Latter-day Saints? Again, you've mentioned about studying, I guess, and being honest and seeing if, uh, if they would want to know truth. But uh, what else? Um, Anything? I, again, you know, I, I believe in prayer. I do believe in prayer and that if they'll just go before God and ask for guidance and do it with an open mind. Yeah. Uh, I know the Mormon Church, you know, encourages that. Yeah. But do that and start reading the Bible. And I know that the blinders will fall off. Yeah. You know, the scales of unbelief will will fall away. And did you feel that that experience you had kneeling with the bishop uh, many years ago is that? again, back to uh, uh, between you and God, huh? Yeah, Is definitely. how you dealt with that? That was a relationship that I then established with, with my God. Yeah. And as time went on, He just, you know, yeah. brought me to a point where I understood who He was. And not religion. Not religion. Not religion anymore, just a relationship Yes, with just a relationship. Well, Danny, you're a delight, and I know there were other things that we didn't cover. You're, he's a relative of Zena Jacobs. And that bothered you at, at the, initially, that she was married to Joseph and then Brigham, all the time married to uh, Henry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes. she's one of your relatives. She I was, guess. yeah. Yeah. Well, Danny, again, thanks for coming. I Thank appreciate you, you sharing. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you spending some of your evening with us, and I hope, you'll, uh, hope you've learned something and that you're willing to, to take a minute and study back up. And if it is true, you have nothing to fear, and you... You are following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Good night.